Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending October 17th. First up, this is from Nature.com. Kilogram conflict resolved at last. The kilogram weight, as far as the national standards and even the world standards, the kilogram is one of the last standards still based on a physical object. It's a kilogram weight that is stored in France, so if anybody wants to get a precision kilogram weight produced, they're going to have to actually have uh, at least some kind of access to this kilogram weight. So what they're going to try to do, and they're going to hopefully define this in the year 2018 when they get together with the uh, uh, International Standards Committee or whatever you want to call it. There's uh, all these abbreviations and stuff you can go through and you'll see them in the article. But basically what they're doing is to get the test results, what they want to do is base it on the Planck constant, and then they're going to put together a couple of different spheres made out of silicone that have a known number of atoms, and it'll be based on the weight of the original kilogram, and then that way every other laboratory that can reproduce this same silicone type of sphere. Um, there's also some other ways you can do it, too. You can do it using electromotive force, but this, this is two of the different ways they're going to use to test it. And in other words, there won't be a physical object tied to a kilogram anymore. It'll be anybody with a decent kind of uh, university lab or something like that can reproduce a super accurate, super precision kilogram that will agree with all the rest. So it's about time they did that, and they have standards based on independent things other than an object itself and this is going to be the last one that's going to fall by the wayside and I think they've got enough accuracy in the measurements now that uh, around 2018 will be the last and they'll say the official kilogram weight will be retired to the museum instead. And next up this was sent to me by Joshua H. Driverless taxis are hitting the streets of Japan next year. Now this is just going to be in limited use in certain areas in the city but especially as J Japan's uh, people are aging and a lot less people able to drive. <clears throat> this way you'll be able to have you'll be able to call a robot taxi and within at least limited areas and parts of the city for a, an initial test it'll be able to take you to your destinations. I think according to um, as far as limited areas go and stuff like that, I think you could probably even prove based on tests I've seen on the Google cars and other cars that these cars could probably be safer than a, a taxi driver even possibly because basically the computer reacts so quickly to situations and it's so much more observant. I mean, you can basically get a 360 degree field of view. I think for limited areas and in cities and things like that where... Uh, the patterns pretty much stay the same. It's when you it's when you get out in rural areas and the markings on the roads aren't so good and stuff like that to where you can have problems with robot vehicles transporting people around, at least with not having a, a person as a safety backup. So, yeah, this test is going to be for a period of time and see how it comes out. Um, let me read just a little bit of the article for you here. Self-driving car technology has come a long way in a very short space of time. Since Google et al. kicked off their autonomous automobile programs, the idea of letting robots take the wheel has become more and more plausible, and now a fleet of self-driving taxis is scheduled to take to the roads of Japan as early as next year. A partnership between the Japanese federal government and Robot Taxi will see 50 people taking part in a trial scheme in the Kanagawa prefecture just south of Tokyo. The trips will cover about three kilometers and involve some of the main roads in the city, which is perhaps why human drivers will still be on hand in case they need to take over an emergency. So they're not going to leave these people with uh, taxis with no driver, and it's just the driver will be, basically, if these things work good, the driver will just be along for the ride. This next one is from NT8. It's from Fox News. Gibbs Technologies developing amphibious motorcycles. I'll show you a few of the pictures here. Basically, it's just a very wide, plasticky motorcycle. There's two versions of it. I guess there's a two-wheeler and a three-wheel version. And it's a lot like a lot of other amphibious vehicles you've probably seen in the past. There have been a couple of attempts to do an amphibious car. And uh, I don't know. Still, to me, as bulky and as wide as this motorcycle is, it's not something that's going to catch on for your typical motorcycle rider, and it may turn out to be like the other amphibious vehicles, more like a, a toy for the rich or the jet setters to kind of just say they owned one, so um, I don't know. It, it might actually even, you know, it might work out to be something, but I, I really have my doubts about it. They say it uses a two-cylinder motorcycle engine that's connected to a water jet, and wheels are tracked and tucked into the hull when you ride it into the drink. Gibbs VP of Marketing Tom 
where Kulik says the 55 horsepower vehicle in it can hit 80 mile per hour on land and 37 miles per hour on water. Yeah, to me the part about it that I don't really like a lot is you've got this really bulky white motorcycle, which is not going to be a lot of fun to drive. So um, you're, you're basically, and what these things usually end up doing too is they end up costing as much as if you bought two separate vehicles. So you could buy a really well handling motorcycle and a real well handling jet ski or whatever you want to call it like that and still maybe save a little bit of money but have two vehicles that handle really, really well instead of one vehicle that does each thing kind of in a mediocre way. And at the last, I would like to just give you a link to the video here. This is the battle. It's called the Battelle Drone Defender, but there is not really a lot of information along with this. This is something that's a, a kind of a weapon thing that produces an EMP, and supposedly if you have a drone in your area that you want to knock down, now there's because of all the different laws and regulations they say even in this video that this is a simulation because generated an electromagnetic pulse like this is going to create all kinds of trouble and probably get you accused of at least a, a misdemeanor if not a felony charge for even using this type of thing but supposedly uh, someone is working on this so that it can be developed to knock drones out of the air using a little electromagnetic pulse uh, I also imagine any kind of hacker that's really into electronics would probably be able to figure out how to build one of these too it's just the fact that you also uh, sending out wideband electromagnetic pulses and stuff like that has a lot of other problems in current besides uh, just you getting possibly locked up for it. But if you want to, I will put the link as the very last link so you can just watch a demonstration of how they propose this. I, I imagine it's very, very possible that the military even has stuff like this now for use in battlefields and limited areas and stuff like that. I mean, basically, they make themselves immune from all the FCC regulations and all that anyway, and maybe even pretty soon the police departments will have that. So, yeah, you might all of a sudden be uh, flying one of your DJI phantoms over a scene trying to take a picture or something like that and have it uh, come down out of the sky. So just be aware that technology like that is out there, and uh, check out and watch the video if you get a chance. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Thanks a lot for watching. Thanks for everybody that contributes. I will catch you next week.